very good. All right, so we're going to start today with a discussion on uh, living with a creative mind. And the uh, the hope is that this would really be a discussion. Um, so I'm going to share some thoughts, some ideas, some quotes. Um, but then I want to just open up and have each person share um, and ask questions and um, share their experiences and their hopes. But let's just start with prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for um, for the gift of Jesus Christ that we, who we just celebrated and the gift of creativity, Lord, which creativity is really about newness. And Lord, you have given us newness of life through your son. I pray um, for each artist here in this room that you would just bless them, that you would encourage them, that you would... Um, Give them, provide for them in this coming year, Lord, that January is a is a cold and dark month, regardless of where we are. And um, so I pray that you would remind us that you are the light, Lord, and uh, keep our eyes directed on you. Guide our conversation today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. So, uh, Josh, if you would bring up slides for me, I would be so grateful. So the idea is, is starting this new year off thinking about who we are, because so much of the time at this point in the year, people are focused on what they are supposed to do, setting goals, setting resolutions. And of course, ultimately, we generally fall off with those, which is why the next year we start over again. And we say, oh, here's my new resolution. Here's my new goal. I mean, does anybody have experience with that? Um, yeah, a little bit. And setting goals is not a bad thing, but goals require um, our heart to be in the right place. Now, creative people often feel that Creativity is something magical and mysterious, that it's a storm that we weather through, and um, and then something beautiful can come out of it. Have you ever noticed how beautiful the sky looks after a storm? Um, often we can feel that way with our, our creative works. But Ken Robinson says that creativity is simply the process of having original ideas that have value. So um, tell me what, what do you think is the key word in that definition? Creativity is simply the process of having original ideas that have value. For me, I think it's process, um, especially as a performance artist, that's, it all comes down to that, so. That's, that's exactly where I was going um process so the creative process has four main phases josh would you shift to the next slide please and i want to go ahead and uh share actually i'm going to jump sorry back. and i want to share a lot of the ideas that i am working through today have actually come out of this book living with a creative mind. And I encourage anybody to get your hands on it. It will help you better understand who we are. Um, it's by Dr. Jeff Crabtree and Dr. Julie Crabtree. They have a ministry in Australia. And for a long time, this book was very difficult to get your hands on. Um, but now, at least in the States, it was available on Amazon. And so I didn't have to have it shipped from Australia. Um, so this is one of their, their ideas. The zebra, this is just a, an image for us to work off of to better understand who we are. The zebra is a symbol of the creative mind because it is a creature of contradictions. So let's look at some of these. Opposites. Black with white stripes or is it white with black stripes? It's a paradox. Highly individual. No zebra has the same stripe pattern as any other zebra that has ever existed. Untamable. Have you ever noticed that nobody is riding a zebra around? I would um, absolutely ride a zebra. 
I bet you would try because you are creative. If you find a way, let us know and we'll rewrite the book. But all attempts to tame zebras have failed. They're highly sensitive. They have excellent eyesight, hearing, senses of smell. They communicate using sounds and body language. And they're very social. They have complex communication systems within the herd or harem. And I think as creatives, we often think that we maybe are not social, but the reality is that we are. We can isolate ourselves because we feel different from those who are not like us, but we are wired. We are created by a God who created us for community and fellowship and collaboration. So this is a lovely picture of just who we are in this paradox. So moving forward then to the creative process that Kelly pointed out, has four phases. Curiosity, where your inquiring mind is set free to wander and notice. Perception, where something is seen, revealed, felt, or recognized. Discovery, where something is interpreted, known, or found out. And last, production, where something is made, performed, or realized. So again, we're going to walk through these, but I want you to be thinking about them in terms of how are you approaching, how are we approaching the way that we look at the pressures of the new year and what our goals are and what our desires are and what our plans are. So curiosity is always the first phase, but these last three, three phases, uh, perception, discovery, and production rarely happen in a straight line. The first one, perception, I see. Who would volunteer to read this, this quote? Kelly. Um, perception, I see. What a piece of bread looks like depends on whether you're hungry or not. Our notion of reality is molded by our parents, schooling, and culture. Since we all come from different backgrounds, so do our perception of things. That is not to say we experience totally different things, but different aspects of those things. The Hindu's view of a cow in no way corresponds to that of a canning factory meat packer. To alter our particular personal construct requires a substantial leap of imagination as we need to see things from a new angle. Only when this is expressed through a creative action can it be experienced by others. Alan Fletcher. So that quote really struck me um, because what it really boils down to is that perception is not just our five sentence senses, but it includes the emotional. So what we perceive, what we see is very unique to our circumstance. And that's the case for those of us who know Jesus Christ. So, um, but it also applies to the opposite. If we are angry, then something that's not offensive becomes offensive. If we're depressed, then something innocent might feel like an attack. Um, we need to be really cognizant uh, of what our perceptions are, but the possibility that's bound up inside of that is is monumental. It's like it's it's a it's a seed that can be germinated because, as this quote reflects, we can see something that others would find impossible to see. And then through our creative product, at the end, we give them eyes to see and ears to hear. So some of the ways that perception gets blocked down, what do you think? Let's open it up to just discussion. What are some of the reasons that your perception would be blocked? Hmm. 
Maybe fear of change. Fear of change. Absolutely. Fear of opinion. Other people's opinion. Yeah. Ignorance, maybe. What's that, Vanya? Ignorance. Ignorance? Being ignorant of others, others and their opinions and their views. Right. Yeah, I think fear of failure and um and just the unknown is a big hindrance a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I think exhaustion is another one, a physical reason. Whenever we we go and go and go and we uh, uh we can be both I think physically and spiritually exhausted. So then what are some of the ways that we can activate? What are the opposites of those? How do we activate our perception? Could I just jump in and add one more thing, which is um, dullness is uh, something that blocks uh, perception. Mm. If we're dull, if there's dullness in us for any reason, it could be um, physical, like you say, exhaustion, or um, we didn't eat anything recently, or didn't sleep enough, or we're not in the habit of paying attention. But I mean, right. um, as we get into the question of uh, what can we do about it, um, I think, I mean, this has been something I've been really focused on. So I guess I'm kind of, uh, I'm pretty aware of of this feature. I mean, I keep thinking of um, the verses in Malachi in this setting now, but also they're not about this setting particularly. They're not about creativity. Um, God rebukes the Israelites for, um, well, the Israelites, men, for, um, you should have been awake and aware, but you weren't. And now look what you did as a result, basically, concerning their marriages. And um, so um, dullness, lack of perception, um, the maybe lack of desire to be to be aware or to be uh curious or to want to get into something new um i think those things sort of hang together and also um like i say i think there is a spiritual dimension of this or to this well it's interesting you say that because right before you spoke i was going to say as a way to perceive play, the importance of play. Mm -hmm. So I think in combating dullness, like I just went through a pretty hard period and I, but I have a friend staying with me. So she's just been la making me laugh constantly. And it's incredible how just like the physical act of laughter makes you aware of beauty and humor in the world, which makes you able to perceive things that when you're depressed or dull or whatever, you're just completely completely blind to. Mm. I would say one of the points of my last sermon that I did a few days ago is remaining with a sense of awe for God's glory, but also God's creation. Because I think one of the stumbling blocks I have with perception as an artist is distraction and maybe even the word obsession, where I become like totally focused on one thing, completely distracted by one thing, and I can't see anything on the outside. So I think being intentional about looking at a leaf and looking at the sky and thinking about God's glory and looking at the moon. Um, <clears throat> being intentional about looking outside the thing that I'm most focused on. Right. Yeah, I think it's, it's intentional about not being short-sighted, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that that's applicable in um in the awe that we see but also in um in being open to understanding what's happening around the world not being so insulated in our own little spheres and what our own 
tiny political problems may be or cultural problems are and and making idols out of those. I remember when I first started to paint um, how uh, clouds became important to me, uh, especially drive, driving down the street um, or a highway, and then you see these wonderful cloud formations, and I noticed them more, and I, I uh, not even more often, but I noticed them more in depth and, uh, and, and then sometimes would put, not when I'm driving, but, you know, just look at a cloud like that and, and uh, just to see the detail as I could see the detail. It's Cause it somehow rem reminds me of what Renoir wrote. He said that uh, it's one thing uh, to look at an apple, to eat it, it's another thing to look at the apple to paint it, and and so you see the same thing, but completely different uh, senses are activated. Hmm. Right. Yeah, that's interesting because um, a minute ago I said being short-sighted, but actually narrowing our tunnel of vision can also expand what we're seeing within that that. Uh, sort of like lens mm -hmm. um i've always mm -hmm. felt that that was the that was really the function of poetry was to like shut the light off in a room and then shine a flashlight on one thing and then that light through a poem would illuminate the one object it lands on in a way that you never would have seen before if you're looking at it in in a room full of light you know, yeah. film, filmmakers will do that as well. You'll sometimes see filmmakers like look through their yeah. fingers like this because it's roughly a 16 by nine aspect ratio. And it allows you to like just focus in on what you want to see in the frame hmm. and yeah, not I was be distracted by the outside. I was going to say as an actor, it's specificity is the word we use a lot of times. And it's in a scene and with your with your character development. Um, having extreme specificity on every nuance um within the scene is, is so important and so key really really good thoughts you, so one more thought or do we need to go on sure go on no 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 it's okay chuck all right um before i learned to paint I was visiting uh, a museum um, and there was uh, Monet's there. And I had a, a little, like a little map or a little program. So I rolled it up into a, uh, to a tube. And I remember going up to a Monet painting. It's a woman uh, with a parasol, uh, you know, beautiful, beautiful thing. And I just remember just kind of scanning this this beautiful painting through this tube. And someone next to me um, uh, said to me, are you an artist? And I said, no, I'm not. And then she said, I think you should be. Now, she was an artist. She says, because th this is how artists look at reality, this is how artists look at at paintings. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> so she was she was articulating the difference between a creative mind and uh, you know, a, a, we're all creative in a sense, but you understand what I'm where I'm coming from. Yeah. Um, the creative mind does function differently. So so we talked about perception is I see and um, before, you, before you move on Natalie I just yeah. wanted to like make note of like how our conversation just sort of evolved into like a really interesting concept of we all started by saying look everywhere look broad look outside yourself and then when you find something interesting it's narrowing in and noticing the details so that's a that's 
an interesting process that I think we just discovered. Yeah. Or or unveiled. Yeah, I agree. And it's it's ap it's applicable to every art form. Hmm. And and it probably each community um and fellowship. Um so the human mind has and we won't go to the next slide yet, Josh. Um but the human mind seems designed to do two things really, really well, which are a part of what it means to think. Number one is to try and make sense out of what looks like chaos. Number two is to try to imagine the possibilities or to dream. So I'll say those again. Number one, to try to make sense out of what looks like chaos. And number two, to try to imagine the possibilities or to dream. So we need to imagine, and we also need to make sense of things. Those are, they seem to be complete opposites, right? But they are together, they make up what it means to think. So let's go to the next slide. Discovery is the next phase of uh, the creative process. And it is to, I think. Now, uh, I'm trying to choose some quotes that I think might be surprising here. Um, Gaeta, would you read this verse for us? Well, when we said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming. Come therefore, let us know, kill him and cast him into some pit. We shall see what will become of his dreams. Hmm. It's not what everybody generally thinks of when we think about dreaming and imagining, but Joseph was a dreamer, right? And um, I think that it's, this is not a scripture, this is just my own opinion. I believe that it probably was some of his creative sensibility that made him so, so much of an outcast amongst his brothers. Um, dreamers are usually discouraged by others. Dreaming is dangerous to those who don't understand, who aren't able to see the potential. It feels unsafe. Um, so the question is, how then do we keep this part of the creative process alive when we have an example right here of how very discouraged our dreamer Joseph was. Let's take it outside of, you know, the biblical um, providential plan of God to, to save the Hebrews. Well, I think I think it's very tricky, especially for artists, but anyone attempting to be different from the society that they are in, uh, anyone who is trying not to conform to the situation, to the context that they're given. And I believe that everyone who behaves in that way is a revolutionary, a potential at least, for a mm -hmm. revolutionary. And we know through history what actually happens to people who dare to revolt against maybe some dangerous regime that they live in and things like that. We know how people end up, we know how the apostles at the end of the day ended up and they all did that with a higher purpose in mind. But those were their dreams. Their dreams were to expand the kingdom of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God. And even though it's dangerous, I think that people who actually decide to end up to going that path take full responsibility and know very well that that is a possibility. I mean, I believe that all of us being Christian are already taking that responsibility. That's just my opinion. Yeah, thank you, Vanya. Mm -hmm. um, I think something like when we were in Latvia this last time, um, when Almer spoke about the pizza wheel and keeping balance and with like, God being like the center of it and how the slices can change sizes and stuff like 
for me at least as an artist it's there's so much about balance not just in my creative side but um especially as an actor it's like you always have to learn to balance both the creative side and the business side um but I think as um just in life um especially from a creative standpoint of not being um like what you're saying e exhausted because like I find myself um very easily emotionally tapped out um when I'm working on something and so um being able to recharge and not be overwhelmed by everything else that's happening um is is a balancing act always that is easier said than done a lot of times um yeah, so. oh, thank you, Kelly. Who else? I don't know how applicable this is, but um, something I'm thinking about is, at least for me, and I think for a lot of dreamers and creatives, we can be maybe over very sensitive to things happening. And maybe this kind of went along with what Fanny was saying, but like very sensitive to things in our culture that aren't right and things happening around us. And that's part of the reason why I don't have social media because I find it or and I don't even watch I would don't want, really watch TV a lot because I find it so overstimulating for my mind and soul and I get overwhelmed by just like the input of messages and like I have a very troubled relationship with my sister and some one of the things she criticizes me for is like the fact I don't have social media like the other day she she basically told me like oh you don't know anything about the world you don't know social media so like that kind of antagonism to people who think differently I'm not sure where that comes from I don't know if it's like fear or if it's it or if dreamers make people confront themselves and that's uncomfortable but I don't know if people have thought about that and maybe that sort of led the dynamic that what happened with Joseph kind of I think it's, I think the Joseph story in that sense, that, that one regard is, is encouraging that it is, it is the nature of humanity. It's a part of sin that there is a fear of, of dreamers. And so one, you're in good company. I mean, you, you could stand to be in worse company than Joseph, right? Um, I think he was a pain in the butt in a lot of ways. I really do. I think he was probably an immature and unwise dreamer in his youth. Um, but he was gifted in this creative capacity. And then uh, God used it. And the key was that he he was brave enough to uh, to follow through. And to keep listening, and and to obey, and um, and to to create whatever it was out of those dreams, and that ended up leading to um, great things and full wells of grain. And so that's that's the next point. Actually, is keeping the well full. And if you think of your inner world, that allows you to draw from. It's made up of experiences and memories and our understanding. And all of that is this huge well that we draw from to make sense of what we feel and what we see and what we hear. Um, and if the well is full, then there's plenty to draw from. But when the well is empty, or I think when it's too familiar, then the discovery process is going to be more difficult. So as you're going into the new year, how do you think you can be intentional about keeping your well full? Like, like from a personal perspective, not abstract, but, you know, like in Connecticut and in South Carolina and in Vilnius and in, uh, in Germany and in Bosnia, for those of us here at the BBI office in South Carolina and in Oregon, like how will we intentionally keep our wells full so that we can not only see but then think? Hmm. so um one thing i've i just finished was my um um vision board and for me 
I also do a goals like list at the start of each year. And I know you talked about that a little bit, Natalie, when, when you started. Um, and for me, like keeping like the sight of the bigger picture um, does allow for things to stay in balance and kind of um, creating that harmony and like just being self-aware. So if I am particularly like burning the candle at both ends, which I often do, um, that I take a step back to practice self-care and rest and um, kind of evaluate where I'm at. Um, but then, yeah, the, the maintaining that focus. Um, and I think for me, visually seeing um, goals and seeing achievement like things that I have that I really want to focus on that like visually visual cues are very important for me to to maintain that focus and to um stay kind of grounded in in what I want to like work towards hmm. I'm also finding that um just in the time that I have been here with bridge builders um, surrounding myself with people that lift me up. Like Kara said, you know, her friend is visiting from Spain and the laughter uh, and, you know, and the, the community, the relationship also helps to fill your, fill your spirit with encouragement. Yeah. Wait, Sally, are, are you saying that we offer you encouragement or you're saying since you started to work here, you have to find extra encouragement? No, it's filled while I'm here. Oh, oh okay. I, I just want to clarify what you mean. <laughs> Both here and outside, but I, you know, I mean, I, I'm noticing it more since I, since I am in the office with, you know, with you two. But, um, I'm noticing it more that, you know, outside also, I also need to surround myself with those friends that will lift me up so that I am encouraged and so it does feel, you know, it feels my well. Yeah. Yeah, and on the flip side of that, well, something I've been working on for a while is putting boundaries with people who suck energy out of you, which seems very easy to find those people. And there are a lot of those in my life currently. But I feel like, oh, maybe some, for some creatives, it's hard to put up boundaries because we tend to be empathetic and compassionate, and we tend to hope the best for people and imagine the possibilities. And so, learning to do that also too, because I start to feel like my creativity is just being squashed because I have to put so much energy into just feeling people I, with people that I shouldn't have in my life. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. I think there's something important about putting things on our uh, uh, schedules or in our diaries. And uh, um, I have found that in the last six months, I keep saying that I'm going to paint more. And I have painted a little, but not nearly as much as I have been able to. And, and I've and I've wondered why you've you can do it, but I'm some a little bit paralyzed. Well, just yesterday I was uh, with another artist uh, here in town, and we decided that on on Fridays we're going to paint together. And oh, I've done that before in the past where you schedule something with another artist or or with a master. And then you then you get it done. And my best pieces of work have happened when I'm painting with someone else, but not right. painting in the public, you know, so people can criticize, uh, you know, or mock or distract, but just that putting it on uh, on the schedule. Well, Chuck, I will hold on to that thought because you're jumping ahead to our, our oh. third point. That is the genius. That is Chuck. Right. Three points yeah. ahead. So, so don't don't forget about it. Okay. Um, I would say, Natalie, that like something I struggle with that I think many artists struggle with, but I'll speak for myself and then others can say if they agree, 
but when someone tries to put my creativity in a in the pit you know like joseph's brothers put him in a pit it's usually a pit i could climb out of but i prefer to just sit and wallow in the pit and say woe is me my art is no good everybody hates me i'm gonna eat worms in this pit and mm -hmm. Like, so it may not be my fault that I get put in the pit, but it's absolutely my fault that I stay in the pit. And that you keep looking down at the mud instead of up at, you know, the sunrise. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Hmm. Yeah, I can, I can absolutely relate to that. Yeah. Um, okay. uh, for me, it helps uh, when I see my goals, when I know that... Uh, I have li limited time to live, maybe 20 years or 30, I don't know, but uh, I need to use those years uh, somehow to use them wisely. And uh, uh, for me helps when I um, put, put a task, uh, for example, to, to make an exhibition and when uh, I, I uh, make exhibition, it's a good start. And it's like step by step going forward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. I would say for me also the way to keep my well full. And this is um, this is under the, the context of being a dreamer. So, so there, okay, I'll back up and say, We've all heard the expression, well, you can't change the past, but you can change the future. I think that's inaccurate. I think we absolutely, as dreamers and creatives, can reimagine the past. I think that often our perception of the past is wrong. Um, we saw something a certain way based on how our feelings were hurt or uh, we were hungry or uh, we were exhausted. And, and if we take time though to dream and reimagine what the past was, that gives us a lot of power um, in how we imagine the future. So I think it's something that is biblical and um, you know, all throughout scripture, God told his people to remember, to remember. And then what is interesting is he would tell them the stories. And I think the reason that he would repeat what happened is because our own memories of the past are faulty and and narrow and, and susceptible to a skewed reality. And so if we spend time, you know, I, I've had, I will say personally, I've had a very difficult year and I've been reflecting on my perception of what, what the joys were and what the truths were of this past year and where God was, even when I couldn't see him. And um, I think it's a superpower that creatives have to be able to reimagine the past, to better align it with God's vision that that fills up our well in order to create. Hmm. So good. Hmm. Um, I also believe Quickly. I also believe that actually um, just creating and working towards something also fills up the well. It's like a positive cycle. And that's why it's very important that when we that, uh, find that we, when we don't have a lot of motivation and when we go those periods of time when we don't really feel like working on our creative things, we, we always have those tiny moments of motivation, of very high motivation. And it's very important not to ignore those moments and start working, which will propel us towards more motivation and towards more work, which will continue the cycle. At right. least that's how I've seen it in my life. Yeah, because the creative process is not linear, right? Is it? It's it's very, I, I think one of my favorite illustrations is actually the grief process and how the grief process is not linear or circular even, but it's like, one of those images of uh, an atom with the the you know 
protons and electrons and they're zipping back and forth everywhere. It's, it's, it's chaos. And yet we would try to make sense of that chaos and the creative process I think is like that too. So you have the discovery and then, and then uh, you have the perception and they're like overlapping with each other. And then you need to take a nap and, and then come back to it the next day. Um, for time's sake, I want to move on to the last step. I actually, I have to go, but it's oh. so good to say, see you guys. Yeah, thank you, Kara. We love you. Uh, yeah, I love you guys, too. I'll see you You're next You're awesome, Kara. You, too. Bye. Bye. Kara. Take care. Kara. Bye. So, so we have, um, we have perceived and we've honed our focus to what it is that we want to see. And then we have discovered, we've thought, and we have considered how we fill up our well in order to be able to discover and think well. And then the last step is is production. And that's Chuck where you were going a few minutes ago. So I make. And now this is the part where I think most people think of when they think of creativity. This is where something is made or it's written or it's performed. This is where the discipline comes in. But the fact is all of that in the beginning is vital in order to get to this step. Um, so Paul, are you, you're not on screen. I don't know if you're available. Do you, would you be able to read this quote to us? Yes, I, I can do this. Um, so to find something that really touches and addresses my attention, I have to do a lot of hard manual work but why shouldn't my work be hard? Almost everybody's work is hard. One is distracted by this notion that it comes fast and easy. And some people are graced by that style. I'm not. So I have to work as hard as any stiff to come up with the payload. Uh, quoted Quotation from Leonard Cohen. I really loved this quote because of the last line. I have to work as hard as any stiff to come up with the payload. Um, Leonard was a prolific poet and, and songwriter. And when we listen to, when I listen to his music, it seems like it flows like, just like you're exhaling. Um, and yet he worked as hard as, you know, a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher or uh, a bricklayer. And so this is where our creativity, uh, what is that expression? Where the, the metal meets the, what is it? Josh. Where Kelly. the rubber meets the road. Where the rubber, rubber yeah. meets the road. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hard lining today. So I'm, I'm <clears throat> against the road. Um, so this is where we need technique and we need discipline and we need the schedule or the diary that you were speaking about, Chuck, right? Um, so what does that look like for you and how, what sort of reasonable goals do you have set for yourself for this year? Mm -hmm. um, so for me, it's like with acting and with, with, um, opera it's all about like submitting um like the submission process because um there's casting websites and so everything is like listed for for projects you might be interested in and like so I am on there daily um submitting for projects um with opera not only do you submit your resume and your your headshot but you also have to submit specific music for um the production that a company is going to be doing or the concerts that are going to be they're, they're working on. And so um, this last year I've been um, reworking all my repertoire for my voice since I've changed from a lyric coloratura to a dramatic coloratura. So it's completely new repertoire. And so it's been really exhausting because I've been having to um, learn new music, record new music to then be able to submit for projects. And so um that's kind of how I stay focused. It's like, like I have my vision board of, of companies that I want to work with and um, cities that I want to work in and places, you know, 
goals that I have. Um, but to make that happen, it's, it's that routine discipline of rehearsing every day and learning new music and recording new music and, um, constantly submitting for things. And then if I have an audition working on the new lines or the new script or the piece that I'm going to, to, to audition with. Um, so it's, it's that thing of constantly just producing. Yeah. So it's exhausting mm. right now, but yeah. yeah. And then balancing that with the actual performance side of things. Cause as a musician for the holiday season was at a number of gigs and it was, it just took a lot out. Yeah. Right. I think Colin's comment on hard work um, is is really important. Um, some consider artists as creative and everything is a product of inspiration. And I think inspiration is part of it and sometimes a small part. But the hard work uh, and sometimes the hardest work is to is to pick up the first brush or to sit down at the piano that's the hardest work <laughs> or at the at the writing pad mm -hmm. the hardest work hmm. and and kelly having uh spent quite a lot of time with you this past summer i mean you're a hard worker <laughs> you're you're a hard worker there's a lot there's a lot that you're trying to do and uh it, it uh, not just during working hours yeah i think it's like anybody that has a small business will tell you or like their own business always talks about how um there's not like a nine to five it's a it's a 24-hour thing where you know like as creatives like our, our creative process never stops and inspiration can strike at any given moment and balancing that with everything else in life is is the challenge a lot of times so. yeah yeah i was just sitting here looking at this group and thinking how beautiful it is how many different art forms and creative sensibilities we have represented in this zoom room um it, it's it's really beautiful and yeah what what's clear is that there is a a commonality there's the common struggle and the common process and so um it's very encouraging to hear each of your thoughts about this you know and it's the technique is going to be different what what one does as a writer and one does as the painter and the singer and the actor and the dancer and the photographer and designer those look very, very different. Um, but the well has to be filled the same way. Uh, the inspiration comes after the same process of seeing. Um, yeah. And this is not just for our generations. You know, I'm the, uh, uh, I'm the old one in this mix. <clears throat> but um, uh, uh, I wanted to maybe put two ideas together. When we were speaking about Joseph, um, obviously he, um, he rubbed his brothers the wrong way. Um, and so they, they threw him in a pit. But it's interesting that his father gave him a coat of many colors, uh, maybe elaborate. I, I'm sure it was elaborate for those times. And uh, his father recognized something special in him and gave him a coat of many colors and he wore it and maybe he wore it with too much pride but it 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 just reminds me of of uh how artists are different and and even even for me i like wearing arty artsy shirts i like i like uh certain things that that maybe a normal person would say well wow, that's gaudy why why would you want to do that I don't know, um, but we have an old man in our church 
He's 95. He was an architect at the Oregon State University for many years. Uh, and and his name's Dan Dan Reed and 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 Josh and and you've met little Dan and he he is shrunk now. He's very short. And uh, but uh, I've known him 40 years. When he was in the middle of his career, he would come to church wearing a bright red jacket. You know, this is in a conservative church and bright red socks. And and uh, his creativity couldn't be contained in his artistic uh, artistic work. It came out in his wardrobe. And uh, and that's just who Dan was, a quiet man, you know, not ostentatious, just quiet, et cetera. So this this the this creativity, it will find a way, just like if you have to sneeze, you have to sneeze. Uh, what's in comes out. <laughs> it sounded like you said what sin comes out. So um, <laughs> I guess well, it depends on the sneezer. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but I think that yeah. Chuck, I, I that made me think of something else though that I think is worth reflecting on. Um talking about what what Joseph wore. And so one of the things though that was the reason Joseph was in the pit was not only because of his dreams but because of how he communicated. And that coat of many colors um, was not the kind of coat that you would wear out in the fields where you were picking grain or you were helping with whatever needed to be done or you were laying the bricks with your brothers. It, I think that Joseph wore it very proudly to say, I don't have to do what you guys do. I'm better than that. <laughs> and I think that artists can have a tendency to isolate and to say, well, we're not like the rest of you. And whether they would say they're better or not, uh, you know, we don't, we don't need to muddy up with other, other stuff. We're different. Um, but that's not what it means to be a part of the body of Christ. And so that's where we take these creative sensibilities and we take these gifts that God have given us and, and refuse to allow them to be used uh, to distance ourselves from the kingdom of God and allow them to be used for the kingdom of God. So the way that we communicate that has to be really different. Sometimes it's taking off that coat of many colors and putting it on somebody else, right? Um, so I, I think all those things are just as we, we are not just creatives, but we are creatives made in the image of God and called to be co-creators because we were saved and redeemed. So we take those things and then we ask God, like, okay, how do you want me to use them? Because they can be used many, many ways. And as we see in the secular art world, they are. I mean, some of you here in this room, um, I know Josh and Kelly in particular, have seen where those things lead in the secular art world. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not filled with grace. Not good. Yeah. Right. So that that's just my last thought is in question, like as you think about perception and discovery and production, how do you bundle all those within your calling and purpose as a follower of Jesus? And then that's that's ultimately our goal. Right. And I say those things, but it's hard to live them out on a daily basis. But I think that instead of having a goal of oh, I'm going to become a marathon runner in 2024, or I'm going to even write a book. Uh, having the goal of looking at what it means to be a creative as a child of God is will end up making us more productive. Thank you. Yeah. Ken... Can one get a copy of your PowerPoint? Sure. Yeah. Um, 1995. <laughs> and handling, and you'll be signed up for a monthly subscription. 
to 17 different things. <laughs> right. So can I just say this is a little bit off topic, but we've been talking so much about Joseph and the coat and whatnot that uh, I didn't have anything to do with this production, of course, but the movie version of the musical Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat with Donny Osmond is very tongue in cheek and a little bit goofy, but it does an excellent job from an artistic perspective of showing the development from an immature dreamer to a God-focused mature dreamer. And it does that excellently. So if you've never seen it, I would I would recommend it. Hmm. Thank you. That's a good yeah. idea. Will you put that into the chat, Josh? Sure. Well, I think that this entire Zoom meeting from the first slide, the perception on the last sentence just spoke to me about responsibility and and all and whenever responsibility is in is a part of the topic, I always think of of Spider Man and the great power oh. comes great responsibility. Yes. Creativity comes great responsibility. God gave us this gift, but he gave it for a reason. God gave everyone this gift, but for a reason. And that's the that's the story that Joseph fails in the beginning of his life and then succeeds later on. Because he stayed faithful to God. And that was his wisdom. He was very wise to stay on the God's path, even through very difficult times in Egypt, etc., and being cast away by his brothers. And that's the responsibility that he took, which eventually ended up leading him to being a mature, mature dreamer. And mm -hmm. I find that a very good message for us. Yeah. Thank you, Vanya. I think, Vanya, also to piggyback on what you're saying, like, um, about gifts and like, we all know like especially with as creatives and i know we've all heard this in numerous um biblical lessons and and in and out of life like if you don't if you don't use your gift and if you don't um work actively to grow your gift then um you can often lose it um and then also i can't remember where it was but i heard it recently in a sermon about how like um oftentimes god will give you additional gifts as you continue to show the fruits of the spirit and the fruits of your labor and his labor and all and and that blessing in your life and so um i think it's so important to not lose sight of like um the the, the blessing of having gifts and using them ultimately for um spreading the gospel and finding out how that that works um um, but also just like um, not getting discouraged because, you know, there's that, that quote about like um, every time I thought I was being rejected, I was actually being redirected um, to the right opportunity. Um, and I know as creatives, like if a door closes or if an opportunity doesn't come about, it can be emotionally frustrating and spiritually daunting. And it's like, okay, I'm, I, I guess I'm not, this is not what God wants out of my life. Um, but to not lose sight of the fact that we have been given gifts um and we have been given the ability um through god's grace to 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 share those gifts um for a higher purpose and um and i don't know it's it's it can be tough um when it doesn't seem like things are necessarily like working out, but it's, it's not a redirect rejection. It's sometimes just a redirection and um, protection from the Holy spirit. So. Yeah. That's good. a good about protection from the Holy spirit. I think that happens a lot more than we realize. And that's part of what I've been considering about reimagining the past. Hmm. Yeah. Natalie, yeah. I was wondering if you could show the book again, because I think a slide was covering up your video when you were sharing it. Living a Creative Mind by um, Dr. Jeff Crabtree and Dr. Julie Crabtree. So I just touched on a few of their ideas. These ideas of 
perception, discovery, and production are, um, are gleaned from this book. <clears throat> and there is so much more in here. And they um, they actually have a group of artists called the Zebra Collective. It's out in Australia. And, um, and there's a lot in here about the way that creatives think and how to be a responsible creative child of God. We, we want to know thyself, right? We want to know ourselves and understand better. Um, so I absolutely recommend it. Um, livingacreativemind.com, I think is the website where you can find and you can order the book from them. Those of you in Europe, maybe it's just fine to order it from Australia. For me in the States, uh, it was going to cost a million dollars. And so I was very happy whenever it became available on Amazon recently. So yeah, it's nineteen ninety nine on Amazon. If you're in the States. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So I think for time's sake, we'll close unless somebody else wants to share a thought. We will uh, meet again on February 7th. Same time, same place. And we're going to have a special guest. His name is Brian Chan. And Brian is a most interesting person. He is now uh, serving as the Assistant Professor of Media Arts and Worship at Dallas Theological Seminary in Texas. Um, but he's got all sorts of experience. He uh, lived in Los Angeles for a while. He's been in theater. He's uh, a painter. He's a... I don't know, a Kung Fu Panda. He, he, he has like choreographed all, he choreographed major fighting scenes in, uh, in several ho hit Hollywood films. He's a, just a most interesting individual. Um, and he speaks on beauty to women's Christian conferences. Like he's, God just was very creative the day that he created Brian Chan. As so, a black belt in Kung Fu, and he's a church planter. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, I hope you'll be able to join us. I'll be sending out more information about that. And he'll be coming to Poland in May. Yes. And yeah. Natalie, you and Josh are going to Latvia, right? And We are. We leave in two weeks from yesterday. So January 16. And then we get back on the 29th. So we'll be in Latvia and in Ukraine. Um, we'll be in Ukraine for five or six days, I think five nights. Um, so we'd be grateful for your prayers during that time. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Do I have a, a volunteer who would close us in prayer? I just want to ask, sorry, I'm trying to like make notes of these things. Um, <laughs> Uh, Natalie, you and Josh are going to these two places, Ukraine. Is that right? Yes, we'll be in Latvia and Ukraine. In... Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and when are you going? Um, January 16th through 29th. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I also... Just so people know, we've added a um, events calendar to our website, and we didn't used to have that. Um, so most of our travel and events and um, activities will be listed on the website right on the main page. Yeah, and for those who do follow social media, um, we, we'll be updating on BBI's Instagram and Facebook page with the things that are happening. All right. Um, Chuck, would you close us in prayer, please? Sure. <clears throat> Lord, you have uh, created us with um, unique creative capacity and all of the expressions and nuances that come with it. And uh, we don't even understand a lot of it. And, uh, but we are grateful, and we're grateful that you use the creative people 
and uh, we want to declare to you that we want to be used of you. Uh, and we want to be uh, a blessing to other people and to, a blessing to society. Um, thank you for this discussion today and uh, the insights that were shared uh, by Natalie from this book and the insights shared by those in this room and how that we can we can sharpen each other and encourage each other and give each other insights. Um, and Lord, as, as Josh and Natalie prepare these next two weeks, they'll be very busy. Give them strength and wisdom and focus and energy and keep them from, you know, this next round of COVID that's going around. Keep them uh, strong and healthy. And I pray that this trip would have amazing fruitfulness <laughs> and meaning. Uh, Lord, bless each of us uh, as we continue with our day or enter the night. And uh, and to you be all glory. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much.